as a nurse you are the primary investigator you are spending 12 hours plus with your patient you know your patient best compared to anything else because a doctor comes and goes you're assessing them emotionally physically if they're in distress what's going on and that's why it's very vital for you to know what to look out for to determine fluid status Ooh, i gotta go i've been working told them please don't hit my phone i'm in my zone bro just leave me alone was on the road but that's why i'm coming home now the drinks on me i think we need a toast see i did it for me now my old friends calling told them nothing's for free told me time is money dog so i paid on my fees i was starving for this day now my fan they can't eat hey everyone welcome to the cup of nurses podcast here with your hosts peter and matt two nurses on a mission to change this world one conversation at a time. So let's jump right into it. But before that, if you find value in this show, I want to join us on this mission. It would mean the world to us if you share the show and leave a review. Cupofnurses.com for all the latest merch releases, updates, info, and show notes of what are we up to. And you can find our lifestyle podcast on wearefrontlinewarriors.com. Let the show begin. On this episode, we are going to talk about how to determine your patient's fluid status to make sure they are euvolemic and in homeostasis. A lot of things go into maintaining fluid status. A lot of people suffer from different cardiac issues. Heart failure is definitely a big trending topic here in America. And heart failure is probably the number one contributor to fluid overload. Many times people come in through a hospital, through the ED for a CHA exacerbation that was caused by fluid overload. And then we have to figure out how much fluid they have on, their, on them and how do we get this fluid off of them, which is usually done with some Lasix or some kind of diuretic. So the first two things is what is hypovolemia versus hypervolemia? So hypovolemia uh, refers to the lack of fluid. There's way too little where you're experiencing potentially symptoms such as syncope maybe feeling a little bit oozy or you might be having a low blood pressure so any single time you have hypovolemia you're going to maybe have symptoms such as vomiting diarrhea loss of fluids maybe even due to the blood or you might be on lasix diuretic therapy or you might be having issues with albumin where your third spacing and leaking fluids out and it's causing edema. The opposite of that is going to be hypervolemia. Usually you see that in people that have renal failure, heart disease, anything that has to do with the circulatory system. And some of the things you might see with hypervolemia is going to be crackles in, the, in lung sounds, shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion. You might also have some air hunger. And with hypervolemia, we want to get rid of that fluid. And like Matt said, with hypovolemia, it's due to an overdose of diuretics. And hypervolemia, it's usually possibly due to somebody not taking their diuretics. So we're going to give them more diuretics if they're hypervolemic so they could pee out that, uh, that fluid, the excess fluid in their, in their vasculature. Yeah, and I think assessing your patient's fluid status is vital because it could prevent them from going into pulmonary edema, shock, potentially having a lengthened hospital stay because of them needing to go to the ICU or other, uh, like a step down unit. So after you get your ABCs done on your patient, which is airway and breathing, and they're doing good there, you want to look at the circulation system and making sure that their blood pressure is good. So how do we assess a patient's volume status? So we're going to go down some assessment findings of what you might find, and then we're going to go into some labs and then different types of ways that we measure and check for fluid status and actually some cool tips on what you can do if you want to quickly assess your patient to see what is their fluid status. So the first thing is making sure that the patient is not bleeding anywhere. So if you have a source of bleeding, you might have a low hemoglobin count, hematocrit, which could be contributing to being hypotensive or having an issues with the fluid status. The patient might be vomiting, so they might be losing electrolytes, they're losing volume that way. Maybe they're having diarrhea, which is excessively getting rid of the extra fluid in your body, which could be contributing to hypotension. And another one is 
patients that have fevers and they are very diaphoretic. We don't understand how much we lose volume when it comes to just having a simple fever. I know when we go to the sauna, sometimes we come back and weigh ourselves and we're down like a pound or two. So just think about how much fluid your patient is losing if they're having a fever for 12 hours and the freaking bed sheets are soaked and all that. So keep those in mind if you want to assess your patient's fluid status. So a fever could mean tacky, but the tacky could also mean that they're losing fluid and we need to replenish it. Another good place to look for what's affecting your patient's volume status is going to be their, their urine output and their color. Is it very yellow? Is it straw colored? Is it clear? Are they peeing out a lot? Certain conditions like uh, diabetic, um, keto or diabetes insipidus, you're going to have a lot of changes with, with the volume. So you want to look at the urine. Is it really, really dark and amber? That usually signifies that there's some kind of hypovolemia going on. You got to rehydrate them. Another good place to look is going to be, like Matt said, the heart rate. Tachycardia usually signifies a hypovolemic status. Usually if, for example, people are bleeding out, they get tachycardic because they need that volume. So we give them uh, some blood to, to combat that. Lung sounds is uh, another place to look at. If they're fluid overloaded, you're going to hear crackles, ronchi. You might hear a little bit of wheezing, them, them struggling to, to breathe. Those are, those are probably like your top three contributors to what's going on with the, with the volume status. Your output, heart rate, and then lung sounds. Lung sounds are usually the last to go because fluid tends to go there a little bit later. So a lot of times lung sounds, if you're already hearing bad lung sounds, he's probably been, or he or she has probably been a fluid overloader for quite a bit of time. I remember from nursing school, you could also assess your patient's heart sound, like at the gallop rhythm, to see if they're in fluid overload. But let's be honest, man, how many times have you heard a third extra sound on top of the lub dub that you're like, I think my patient's in fluid overload? So there's so many other things that will lead you to the assumption that, hey, I think I need some fluids, or hey, I think my patient's fluid overloaded. You could also check cap refills. And I think that's not as indicative of things. But you could look at the oral intake that your patient has been taking in. And you could be assessing their mucous membrane to see if they're moist, actually, or if they're dry. If they're a renal patient, we're going to be checking daily weights. So if the patient is dry, they've been losing a few kilos, your urine output's low, we can start kind of building the assumption that we need to add fluids on. And that happens a lot with um, fluid restrictions for the heart patients. And we diurese them so much and their mouth is dry or sometimes they take salt tablets, but this that's for another issue. And the cardiologist never wants to give us fluids. And I think sometimes we're beating up the kidneys too much and then we see it in the labs and then it's better to hydrate the patient. But I'm not a doctor and I can't make those um those assumptions and then yeah. when it comes to this like the circulatory system and fluid volume status it's like a battle or you could say or just a a team approach usually with the renal team and the cardiac team usually cardiology wants them dry as possible and the renal team usually wants a lot of fluids to get the kidneys working so it's usually a battle amongst more fluids or less fluids, and then you have to find a, a happy medium. I know working in a cardiac ICU in my past, we liked our patients as dry as possible. We'll talk about CP a little bit later, but we always wanted them dry. We, because their hearts, because they were in heart failure. They weren't necessarily always in a fluid overload. They just had a really, really bad heart, which them being in, for example, a normal fluid status was too much for them. They had to be drier than your average person for their heart to be able to keep up. Otherwise, they would get a CT of exacerbation. They would get real sick and they could potentially die. So it was always interesting to see when you had a CHF patient come in with also renal failure, how the cardiologist and uh, the renal team have to work together and figure out, hey, should we hold this LASIK? Should we give this LASIK? The creatinine's been uptrending. Maybe we should hold it, but then we need well, then we have to give the laces because technically the heart's more important than the kidneys. You have two kidneys, so you have to first think about the heart. It's a very intricate system and uh, very intricate on the way they, they do these calculations and they do these things. And I think as a nurse, you are the primary investigator. 
you are spending 12 hours plus with your patient. You know your patient best compared to anything else because a doctor comes and goes. You're assessing them emotionally, physically, if they're in distress, what's going on. And that's why it's very vital for you to know what to look out for to determine fluid status because the doctor is going to come to you and based on the confidence you have in your assessment, that's going to change the doctor's perspective. If you're kind of saying, well, I think I need a fluid bolus and you're not even confident in saying that the, that the patient is tacky, the mucous membrane is dry. And if you know these things, you're going to be able to build your case so much better so the doctor can believe you. And it's not necessarily believing you so you you are right and you can make this better assumption. But again, it's back to the patient advocacy, knowing what's going on. And I think there's a lot of times where what, why I'm mentioning is just through experience. I became better and better over time to assess fluid status or what my patient needs. And a doctor will say no. And I say, but doc, X, Y, and Z is happening. I think we really do need fluids. And you can, not, you can argue with them for the sake of patient advocacy, and you can get what you need so the, better, so the patient feels better. Mm. And then to get a really good predictor of the fluid status, the easiest approach for us besides the assessment is going to be looking at, at labs. So your full blood count and your electrolytes. So if you are hypovolemic, think of that as having a glass of water and you have a bunch of salt in it right and you pour some of some of that water out but the salt still stays in there so with hypovolemia you're going to have an increase in sodium an increase in electrolytes you might be hyperkalemic uh, hypernutremic you might have those issues because your volume is going down and by your volume going down the contents of your blood and the things that make up that contents your electrolytes and all the other things they're going to go up because you have already less water. So it's almost, sometimes you could say it almost artificially inflates the amount of electrolytes you have in your system. Another one is checking urine and urine osmolarity or serum osmolarity. And this is for your patients that are in SIDH or diabetes insipidus. If you are retaining a bunch of fluid, your urine osmolarity is going to be very low. And if you have somebody that's dumping out a ton of urine, the osmolarity is going to be high. So based on that, you can make assumptions and see what do we need to do. Of course, we need to treat the underlying cause. So if they have SIDH, we might have to give desmopressin versus trying to give them fluids to compensate for that. Yeah, back to labs real quick. I just want to mention uh, something called dilutional hyponutremia. That means you have a high volume, which is then diluting your stall. That's a pretty common occurrence in a hospital i don't want to say pretty common but it does happen is definitely going to be on the nclex i feel like and definitely on your exams dilutional hyponutremia where you have a dilution in, in sodium you have so much excess water in your system where artificially your sodium is lower which can lead to seizures and a few other complications of brain swelling brain edema that you don't want to happen they don't want to have happen to anybody yeah another great marker is BMPs, which will, they'll check for your congestive heart failure patients. So if you have somebody that is in fluid overload, the heart is stretching out a lot, releasing that hormone BMP that you're, you're going to be able to see and determine that, hey, we need to diurese this patient. So going into some regular assessments, of course, you can check your standard vitals, look at the map, and you can make an assumption based on the patient's fluids, but also always look at trends and trends will give you the idea whether this patient is naturally low and maybe they don't need fluids. So of course, use your assumption. I think what we need to start doing P2 is uh, do some case studies and just read off a quick little case study and help develop people people's critical thinking skills of how they should assess the patient, what steps they need to take. Uh, but one cool technique that I found online that I'm going to mention right now on the podcast, and I can't wait to try it when I'm back in the hospital, is the passive leg raise. So this is without a blood pressure cuff. You're going, you're going to be able to see if your patient will be fluid or responsive. So you could either lift your patient's legs up in the air if they're unconscious or you tell them to do so, or you could tell them to maybe position a bed in a 45 degree angle. And what happens is you'll get a baseline blood pressure prior, and then you could check the blood pressure afterwards. And what happens is 
this is almost acting like an artificial fluid bolus because you're shunting the blood from the legs into the core of the body. So you raise the legs up, the blood pressure went up, maybe 10, 20 milligrams of mercury. That's a positive sign that your patient is hypovolemic and they could use some fluids. I Loki, I don't think I've ever, ever done that in my, in my nursing practice. But what I do do sometimes is if someone's hypovolemic or hypotensive, what I usually do is I just raise our feet up. That way you're shunting, same, same idea as what you meant. So you're shunting that blood more towards the core, towards the heart to maybe help them perfuse. And same thing, um, if you, they're hypotensive, you could put them in a Trendelenburg and you could hyperperfuse the brain a little bit if you're really struggling to, to get this patient into a normal blood pressure range. Another thing that we could do is... I was going to say, I'm looking forward to having an ICU patient that's hypovolemic, that has an A-line, because I'll, I'll do the passive leg raise and see how many milligrams of mercury the A-line has increased after I raise their legs up in the air. <laughs> Dude, we should, next time we work together, we should do that. Like, I, I've never done that. It'd be pretty cool to see if, uh, like, how accurate that is, actually. Yeah. Another thing that we could do is going to be orthostatics. So with orthostatics, you're going to have your patient lay down for a few minutes, take their blood pressure... Then you have them stand up for a few minutes and take their blood pressure again. And if there is a change of 20 millimeters of mercury or, or greater, then that can be a sign that your patient is potentially hypovolemic and they could benefit from a little fluid bolus or a little, a little nursing bolus, as we say. Yeah, I, had, I remember I had a patient with orthostatics where they were giving minadrin. They couldn't figure out why this patient was in the 70s after standing up for two, three minutes. So a lot of things we didn't mention in the assessment as well is if you maybe tried fluids and different interventions and nothing else is working, we should look at the patient's medication history or the current medication that they're taking on and seeing what we can omit to see if there's a change. What if it's the metoprolol that's causing issues? Maybe we should cut the dose. Do they still have to be on specific antihypertensives? What if it's a male patient that has BPH and they're taking Flomax, which is causing you to be hypotensive as well? There's also other medications that I usually read in the chart, that like the psychiatric ones that could cause other issues. But that's out of my scope of practice of remembering all the crazy drug interactions that are happening. So... But yeah, things to keep in mind to develop your critical thinking skills on what else might be going on as a detective that you are as a nurse to figure out, we got to get this patient out, why is he hypotensive, and we troubleshooting. Another one that you could do is called jugular venous pressure. So with this one, I think you could also refer to this as JVD, uh, jugular vein uh, distension, if if I remember it correctly. So basically you lay a patient down at a 45 degree angle and you have them turn their head slightly to the left and then you assess the, the jugular vein. And if it's protruding or if it's sticking out more than you can see on an average person or your other patients, that can be a, a sign of, of hypervolemia, hypertension. It could also be a sign of, of CHF, of heart failure. So hopefully you don't, run into something like this because if it's undiagnosed guess what you just caught somebody in a in a heart failure and sometimes people have really really bad heart failure where you can see the jvd just when they're sitting normally they just the jugular vein just sticks out on both sides because there's just so much fluid there and so much tension that it literally just just protrudes and it's definitely very very noticeable especially in the late stages of heart failure another one that you can use which is pretty common in the ICU. So this is, we're going to start getting into more invasive lines that we use in the ICU to assess uh, pressures. So one of them is the central venous pressure, CVP, and that's directly connected to the main central venous pressure that's closer to the heart where we can monitor the patient's fluid status. So this checks preload, which is the amount of volume that's in the ventricles after um, on, um, after the systolic phase in diastole. So what happens with CVP, a normal one, is 8 to 12. And if it's too low, that means we should be giving fluids. If it's too high, they're fluid overloaded. In my experience, and you can probably cont contest to the same thing, P, is 
it's really hard to find a great baseline of CVP. It's not always definite. They're, they don't always work, and there's always issues with CVPs. So what I always say is just follow the trend. See how the trend has been. Is the trend increasing or decreasing? And then you can start making your judgment along with other assessments that you gathered to see if the patient needs fluids. Yeah, and then the CVP catheter, that's going to stay in the in the right atrium. Sometimes we could get a CVP off a pick line where it's just hanging out in, in one of the, the, the vena cavas. That's also possible, but it's not going to give you as accurate of a number as if it was in the in the right atrium. Ideally, it's where you want to go. But yeah, like you said, because I actually had a patient last week where we were doing CVPs. Actually, there was no order for CVPs, but they had the CVP hooked up, so I was just doing them for fun. And you could definitely Good sports, huh? Yeah, yeah. And because I always like to check, because you know, working in cardiac, we always used to check all the numbers. We always used to do swans in, in, in the cardiac ICU. We always used to check numbers before we give Lasix. And this lady had Lasix, I think Q8 or Q6. And I would all I I checked it before, and she was at like seven eight. Gave it her Lasix. She put out a ton of urine and it dipped down to like five four. But like you said, normal is between eight and twelve, but it's only so accurate so like you said you look more at the trends is it going down when you're giving lasix or is it not doing anything maybe you got to give more lasix then so it's more of it's more of the the trends that you have have to follow but it's cool to have that and actually see that hey this medication i'm administering is lasix is actually pulling out the fluid and i could tell not by just because of the urine but i could also tell because a CVP is telling me it's downtrending. It's it's really it's really interesting. It's really it's really cool. I like my numbers. That's why I like cardiac ICU. I like to I'm a numbers based kind of person. So that's always intriguing to me to look at just the CVP before Lasix and then afterwards. And then it's interesting because then like when they're due again, the CVP starts to trend back up. So if you give Lasix at 8 p.m., so a CVP at 7 p.m. might be nine. You give Lasix at eight. We check it at 10. CVP might be down from nine to let's say seven or six. And then once you come close to the next dose of Lasix, let's just say it's now it's six o'clock in the morning, you're about to give it at seven. Now the CVP is back up to nine. So it's like a, a little dance that you do with, with the fluid because a lot of times if someone's getting, getting Lasix in the ICU, they're also probably getting some kind of medication like a presser or, or a heparin or just something. So you have to counter counteract those meds that you're giving because I think a lot of new nurses forget that if a person is on a lot of drips, they're getting a lot of fluid. Some drips go in at 25 mLs an hour, 30 mLs an hour, 40, 50, and you could have three or four of them, and you got to get that fluid off. And that's why you give the laces. I feel like some IC nurses need to chart their eyes and nose a little more accurately. Like I like I like looking at eyes and nose and, and seeing a urine output at least every two hours. If you don't have time to do it every hour, that's fine. But I think you should do it at least every two hours. That way you're, you're really accounting for the fluid status of your patient. Yeah, I could imagine how stressed out doctors are or the cardiologists or renal doctors where they're trying to tr- check these trends and there's nothing documented. It happens more often the med surgery floors were better in the ICU. But even the little things of intake and output based on what they're consuming. It's so hard to track that, especially if five patients, and this goes back to taking care of the nurse. If you want accuracy in healthcare, you want better healthcare, you need to take care of the nurses so they're able to do these critical thinking jobs or outsourcing other other tasks to maybe lower, uh, not lower clinical staff, but just like CNAs or something. So not saying I, I shouldn't be wiping butts, but if we can offshore that to um, somebody else and I can focus on just the patient and the critical thinking and take more of the de- doctor's role, man, I'll do that kindly. <laughs> 100%. But actually, a nurse actually said something interesting to me a couple of days ago. She's like, why would you want to be a CNA? And not to discourage anybody from becoming a CNA, but she said, and I'm like, and it made complete sense to me. So she said that why would people become CNAs, go to school for eight weeks or six weeks, get this CNA certification wipe ass and make as much or less than somebody that does in like a restaurant or a waiter. So we always yeah, talk tough. about, yeah, we always talk about nurses. Hey, we need higher pay when you higher pay, but so do we CNAs because if you're getting paid just as much as a CNA as you are to cater to people or be a waitress or be a waiter or work at a store, a family dollar or work somewhere where it's less stressful, why would you want to be a CNA? 
why would you put yourself in a, in a situation? So we also have to keep that keep that in mind because I feel like I'm seeing less and less CNAs as the years go on of, of me nursing. People just don't want to don't do them because there's not a lot of reward for that and not a lot of pay. And if you don't bring that, that pay up, people aren't going to want to be CNAs because working at Burlington Coal Factory or Marshalls or Ross or any kind of Old Navy, if it brings you the same amount of money, why would you want to be a CNA? It's tough. I know, especially when you see inflation going up and all these other companies are raising prices and here we are doing god's work critically freaking sweating bullets sometimes because the stress that we're experiencing we're getting paid something equal to somebody driving a forklift or flipping some boxes at amazon it's mind-blowing so yeah we need to advocate that for the future cup of nurses for uh healthcare 2024 representatives man everyone's gonna raise his baby <laughs> yeah let's do it so another way that you can check your patient's fluid status is through SVR, which is called systemic vascular resistance. Usually you need a cheetah or those non-invasive devices that attach to your patient to get that. You could also get into a swan, but we're going to get into that a, a bit later. So if you have these non-invasive management devices in the ICU, you can check an SVR and that checks the afterload of the ventricle so what is the resistance that the left ventricle needs to push out this volume across the whole entire body so our normal svr is between 900 to 1400 dynes per second i believe is the measurement so any single time that your svr drops below 900 your body is experiencing dilation and your vessels are very relaxed so that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. Depends if you have a septic patient. You could also have an SVR that's very elevated. So anything above 1500, that means that your body is clamped up and the resistance is high, which makes sense, right? Vasoconstriction. So that could be a good thing. You could, your body could be compensating to increase the blood pressure. So if you have an SVR that's very high, chances are your blood pressure is being compensated artificially by this high SVR that's clamping down and squeezing the rest of the blood that can be possible. You also might have a case where your SVR is very low and the blood pressure is low as well. Well, usually with sepsis, what happens because of the bacteria, you are experiencing vasodilation from the cytokines that are being broken down. In those cases, that patient is probably going to be in the ICU because we need to do some vasopressors to help increase the SVR by clamping on the peripheral vasculature. I'm glad you brought out the vasopressors because when I was a new grad, I was always thinking of SVR. I was always like, why is everyone's SVR always so high? I'm like, oh, it's probably a heart failure. But then I realized like, hey, these people are on a presser, so that's why their SVR is higher because they need a higher SVR to push that that fluid through their system. And then it was like a light bulb moment. I'm like, they don't have a high, yeah, they might have a high SVR because of the heart failure, but they ha have an even higher SVR because not only a high heart, heart failure, but they're also on, on pressors. For some reason, I it just wouldn't click for me until maybe a few months in. Like I wasn't ever to able to figure out that why is their SVR high, why is their SVR high? And I realized, hey, they're on pressors. It's going to be high. Yeah, when I first started working in the ICU, man, I didn't even care about those numbers. And, and that's what it is. You just start developing your scope of practice and your assessment skills. So when you start off, maybe you're just going to focus on the main stuff that you need to get by your shift. You could play the poker face and you could tell the cardiologist as VR. And to you, it doesn't matter. And then eventually you get better and better and develop the skill set, man. Even like the cardiac indexes stuff, man. Whenever I had... I was in the heart room helping somebody out. I was just like, God, cool shit going on here, man. <laughs> but I don't know what's going on. It just, yeah, it took time. Yeah. And now we're going to talk about Swan Gans catheters. So I worked with Swan Gans catheters for like the first couple of years of my nursing career. And those were the scariest but the coolest things I ever I ever worked with. Not On top of balloon pumps and, and LVADs, Swan Gans were, were real cool because you could get a bunch of numbers from a bunch of different pressures. So a Swan Gans catheter, it goes through your vena cava and it goes through the right side of your heart and it 
the tip lays in the pulmonary artery. So you can get a lot of information out there. You can get the CVP, you can get the pressure in your right ventricle, you can get your wedge pressure, you can get your pulmonary artery pressure, and you can get a mixed venous, which mixed venous is mixed venous is blood drawn off the pulmonary artery catheter, where it's basically the last stop for the blood before it enters the lungs before it gets reperfused with oxygen. So that is always a good indicator of how well your body is able to utilize oxygen. So sometimes people would have a very low, a very low um, SpO2. Yeah, very low SpO2 because they could be going septic. For example, when they're going septic, they're hypotensive, so the blood stays longer in your organs. So your organs take on more oxygen. So that's why you might see a low SpO2 because your body is using more of that oxygen. It could also be indicative of right side of heart failure because your body is too slow to pump all this blood. So the, the same reason stagnation. So it stagnates so your organs are going to use more of the oxygen. And then if you have a high SpO2, maybe you're overly oxygenating your patient. It could be heart failure. It could be a number of things. But I always like swans because you get so much information from them. You can get your cardiac index, your cardiac output, which also signifies your, your fluid status. If you have a low output, a low index, you might be hypovolemic or you might have heart failure. If you're super high, you might be a little bit uh, over overloaded. So I, I love swans. I used to work with them all the time. They're, they're super cool. Then I used in all facilities because they're super invasive and a uh, high infection risk but we used to put them in everybody it's high invasive highly risky but it also gives you the best numbers and the best predictors because you could do the cheetah but that's like an external thing it won't always give you the correct numbers versus a pulmonary artery catheter where it's literally sitting in, in your heart and you're just doing numbers and you're paying attention to how they're changing beautiful beautiful concept yeah, there's also the A-lines, which we didn't really talk about, but it's a standard thing, just like with the blood pressure cuff. It's a continuous monitoring device that checks your blood pressure continuously. So just like a blood pressure cuff, you're going to have a map and a number. So any single time the map is falling less than 65, those are signs that sepsis is developing. Maybe we need some fluids or we need to do something else, like bump up the pressors in the ICU. So we could use that to assess thing. I know as I was creating this show, there's also people that look at stroke volumes and you can look at stroke volume to determine fluid status, but that was just way too much for my brain to try to wrap around physiology and understand how stroke volume is going to tell me fluid status, man. Yeah. There's like a whole formula for that, right? It's like stroke volume yeah. plus something divided by something equals your cardiac output. Something yeah. Like that. yeah. So those are that could be for the ICU doctors if the, all their other assessments aren't working out for them. So, yeah, and just like there's a multiple ways to skin a cat, right? So there's multiple ways for you to check your patient's fluid status. Yeah, and if you have a swan, the best thing for you to remember is quarters over dimes for their pulmonary artery pressure. It should be quarters over dimes. If it's higher than quarter over dimes, it could be a fluid issue, or it could be also a left sided heart failure issues. Because remember, if you have a a high pressure in your pulmonary artery, that means you're pushing against the, the lungs and the left side of, of, of the heart. So that's going to give you that, that higher pressure in a pulmonary artery because you're pushing through higher resistance because of your left side of heart failure. I'm kind of reflecting with all these lines, sometimes it wasn't how to use them and, fun and troubleshoot them and function that gave me the scaries. But it was pulling these lines out because so many times when I was a younger nurse, they always were just magically there for me, never started it. And then like, I remember we were in uh, LA, someone told me to pull a swan. I'm just like, dude, I have no idea how to pull a swan. What do I do? There's like some kind of special cap and stuff like that. That thing's long too. You're pulling for a minute. Yeah. So um, even though... I'm, I feel like I'm a confident nurse. I've been doing this for six years. There's still little things that I have never done in healthcare maybe that still makes me feel a little bit nervous. And that kind of goes back to the thing of, hey, it's okay to go ask people for help or how do you do this because you might do something once and then you haven't seen it in two years and you need to brush up on the thing again. So never be afraid to ask good questions and and learn or ask for help and if the nurse kind of gives you shit or something psh, good for her man doesn't affect me thank you everyone tuning in we went over 
fluid status. We talked a little bit about hypervolemia, hypovolemia, different ways to catch it, to treat it, and also some swan gans catheters and CVPs. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good one. <laughs>